Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke 22, verses 7 through 27. Would you please rise? Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to his house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make the preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be whom would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. I'm going to ask you one more time just to bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, This whole service is special. It's a time we gather together to worship you. But your word is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's alive. It accomplishes the things for which you've purposed it. So I pray, Father, your word would do that in each and every heart here today. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you may not like history. I love history. I was going to get a PhD in church history at one point to teach church history. So some of this is going to have a little bit of history in it, all right? Not a lot, but a little bit. I was raised in a church that observed what we called at that church, the Lord's Supper, once every three months. And and, and even then, since we had Sunday evening and Sunday morning services, uh, Many times, we would take it on Sunday evening, even though we only did it every three months. And for me, I can only speak for myself, but sometimes the observance seemed very perfunctory and not very special. And so one of the things I like the very most about the disciple church is that we take communion every Sunday. And even though there's no directive or direct instruction in the Bible to observe the meal every Sunday, I believe an honest reading of the book of Acts at least leads me to conclude that they did partake of the meal every Sunday. And I have people uh, from my past tradition who will ask me, well, you know, we don't do it. We just do it once every three months because if you do it every week, it's not special anymore. I, you know, and I, I say, well, okay, so do you say our pastor's only going to preach once every three months because that way it, it'll be more special? <laughs> or we're just going to sing songs once every three months because that way it'll be more special? 
But to, to also play um, the other side, I have to tell you, and I have visited other disciple churches where the, the Lord's Supper's just kind of tacked on at the end and they pass the plate and the cup and everybody just takes a piece of bread and drinks a, piece, a cup and passes it down. And it's like, you know. So we might take pride knowing we do it every week, but we shouldn't. We should see it as the gift that it is. And we should be careful how we take it. So we, we read this passage that was just read for us this past week in the one-year Bible. And so I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to discuss this very important meal that we take together as a body every week. And like my opening comment about the church that I grew up in and the fact that different groups call this meal by different names. Some call it the Eucharist. Some call it communion. Some call it the Lord's Supper. Some call it the Mass. That in and of itself indicates that as Christians, even we have many different ways of viewing this taking of bread and cup. In fact, communion, some of you remember the old song, most of you won't maybe, communion like the old song says about happiness means different things to different people. And so there's four questions that have arisen regarding this meal. Now, two of the questions are procedural. How often should you take it, which I already mentioned, and what method should you use? I mean, we pass out the elements normally. We're doing it differently now because of COVID. But we normally pass the elements out. Other denominations or other groups have people come forward. They're given a piece of bread and an individual cup like we have. Others have the people come forward and they put the host on their tongue and they all drink out of one cup. You can imagine how that's gone over with COVID. But that's the way they take it. And in tension, sometimes they have people come up, take the bread, dip it in the cup, and then take both elements that way. So many different ways to take it. Um, And so while those aren't unimportant questions, there are two other major questions that have divided the church about this sacrament that Jesus gave to us. And we might reword the questions this way. What exactly happens when we take communion? And who should get to participate in communion? And now the first question centers around the words Jesus used when He instituted the meal. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. And so the church has come up with four different ways of interpreting that. If you're a Roman Catholic, you believe the bread and the wine literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus because that's what he said. That's their view. Uh, Martin Luther wanted to believe in the real physical presence of Jesus when he broke off and started the Reformation, but he, he didn't believe it, it became just the body and blood of Jesus, but he still believed there was a physical presence of Jesus in the elements. The Reformed Protestant tradition Uh, which came off, I won't give you a bunch of names of people, but they believe in a real spiritual presence in the act of communion. Not, not, Not in the bread and the cup itself, but just in the very act of communion itself, there's a special presence spiritually of Christ. And then there's the free church tradition, which is like Baptists and even disciples at the beginning, where they believe it's a memorial feast simply done to remember, as Jesus said, what He had done for them, the gift of Himself. Now my position, when push comes to shove, uh, I believe there's a real spiritual presence of Christ in the act of communion. I believe there's something special about His presence with us as we take it. But ultimately, here's my other thing. I don't think it really matters, not at an ultimate level at least. I think you could support any of these views of Scripture depending on how literally you interpret the words that Jesus used. Why should we let something that is supposed to unite us on the deepest level tear us apart over semantics and interpretations? And the second question has caused even more division. Who should get to participate. And different groups have come up with different answers. And there's three basic positions for this. 
One's called closed communion. Only people who are members of that particular local church body can take communion when they have communion. It, you would have, if we believe that, you'd have to be a member of Hill Country Christian Church. You couldn't just be a visitor even. You have to be a member. And then there's close communion, which means if you're of like faith and practice, if you're, like, if you go, if you're a part of this denomination in another church, or you have similar beliefs that we have, then you can partake. And then there's open communion. Anyone who's a follower of Jesus, it's His table. It's not any church's table. And so, here's the important thing. Some people see the, the, the Lord's Supper as we're, the church is the custodian. We set the limits of who can participate. But I don't believe that's what Jesus intended. The church is not the custodian of communion, but the channel. We aren't the keeper of the table, building a fence around it to protect it. We are the avenue of expressing the grace of God freely through this shared meal of all of His followers. And as I say many times, Jesus gets to set the invitation list. So if Jesus is the one who gets to set the invitation list, whom would He invite? And since we're trying to answer these important questions, it's interesting that in the Gospel accounts of the Lord's Supper, it's Luke that records for us some interesting questions that, however, is, is comparing the kinds of questions Jesus asked in Luke 22 with the kinds of questions His followers asked. So I invite you this morning to put yourself in the place of the disciples and notice the kinds of questions you and I are prone to ask. We are tend to ask questions of exclusion. Notice, here's what we read. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Jesus speaking, the Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They begin to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Isn't that interesting? A meal that Jesus designed to bring them all together was tearing them apart. And here's one of the reasons. Just like the disciples, we like a pecking order. Look at the questions that began flying back and forth between the disciples. Is it you? Are you the one who's going to betray Jesus? Because I know it's not me. And, and not only that, I've been a lot more faithful to Him than you have. And I'm definitely on a higher rung of the recognition ladder than you are. And they began positioning themselves into some sort of pecking order. And that was the normal way of determining your value at a meal by the way you were positioned around the table. If Jesus is the, the guest of honor, then if you're on His left or His right, that's a better place to be than at the end of the table. And so they were arguing about who deserves what place. And that's also, I don't have to tell you, that's the way the world determines our value. A few years ago, John Cryer from the sitcom Two and a Half Men was up for an Emmy Award. He didn't know he was going to win it, but he won the award, and he began his speech this way. You know, I used to think that awards were just shallow tokens of momentary popularity, but now I realize that they are the only true measure of a person's real worth as a human being. Because <laughs> he won. <laughs> He's tongue-in-cheek, of course. And we laugh at that, but it's so true of the culture we live in. And things haven't changed that much in the past 2,000 years. In fact, when the Protestant Reformation began, Martin Luther began it in Germany, breaking off from the Catholic Church. For, he had his reasons why he felt that was necessary. Almost at the same moment, a man you'd probably never heard of, Ulrich Zwingli down in Switzerland, also broke out. Broke forth. Did you know they were in agreement in, of 13 of 14 different things? Because you know what they didn't agree on? Yes. 
the Lord's Supper. Zwingli thought it was more a memorial meal. He said, Martin, grab my hand, be my brother. Martin Luther wrote on his slate, this is my body. End of discussion. And that's why the Protestants have been splintering ever since. Can you imagine what it would have been like if the Protestants had united and stayed together at that moment in history? How ironic and tragic that this very meal that Jesus began to unite us has instead divided Christians across the centuries. Not a good look to an unbelieving world. Because here's the reality. As Christians, we are called to work through conflicts. Christian unity is not based on agreeing with each other over every issue. By unity, the Bible means... First and foremost, a oneness of heart, a relational unity, being kind to one another, gracious to one another, forgiving of one another, not assuming the worst of each other, not shooting the wounded, not being quick to be suspicious. Biblical unity is about working through conflicts, avoiding slander and gossip, and being generous in spirit. So pointing fingers excluding others, doing things to make us feel better about ourselves is all part of the human condition. But it certainly isn't the way Jesus approaches things. Look at the questions Jesus asked. Questions of inclusion. Look what he said. Here's what it, Where do we want to, us to prepare it? The disciples asked Jesus. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to have this Passover with you before I suffer. And later in the chapter, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercised authority over them called themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Here's the question, for who is greater? The one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus' questions revolve around finding a special place to have a special meal with people who are important to Him. Jesus was not looking forward to what the cross had to offer Him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see just how much He struggled with what was about to happen to Him. He didn't want to have to endure the humiliation and the shame and the pain and the agony. But there was one thing during this last week of his life that he was looking forward to. He had spent three years with 12 men. And they had forged relationships that were bound together by blood, sweat, and tears. They had experienced the agony and the ecstasy together. And in that upper room, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you. And Jesus' other questions as we looked at it, Deals with who is greater. The one who sits at the table or the one who serves the person sitting at the table. And you know, from the world standpoint, that's a no-brainer. But Jesus had a different answer. He identifies with those who serve. And He calls us to do the same. Because you know what? If you sit at the table then you always have to be concerned about your position. Where you rank. Am I in a place of honor? Or am I seated at the lowest end of the table? But you know what? If you take the place of the servant, you're just glad to be included. So here's the incredible truth. Jesus still eagerly desires to eat a meal you and me. Jesus hasn't changed His mind. He still eagerly desires each and every week to eat this meal with you and me. 
Because you know why? Eating a meal with somebody has a special significance. Why is eating together important? Because it says something about the equality we have in Christ. That God doesn't show any favoritism or partiality. I mean, you know this, you don't eat a meal with somebody unless you want to be with them. Because over a meal, we, we share and we talk and we laugh and the, we get to know each other in a more intimate way than any other type of conversation. And that's why when Jesus walked this earth, the greatest insult the Pharisees could think of to hurl at Jesus in their minds was, look at Him. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. I mean, to the Pharisees, you might have to rub elbows with those people out on the street, but you're sure not going to sit down and eat a meal with them. But Jesus does. He still does. Aren't you glad? I don't recall a single invitation to a meal that he ever turned down. Jesus never turned down an invitation to eat with somebody. And look at that. He went to eat at Simon the Pharisee's house. A religious man who was self-righteous. And while eating with him, a woman who was a well-known adulteress came to the table and washed Jesus' feet with her tears. Now think about that. What extremes. Both at the same table with Jesus. I want to close with a story written by a man named Bob Benson. And I want you to listen. If you even want to close your eyes while I'm reading it. So pretend you're back in kindergarten. I wish I had some milk and cookies to pass out, but I don't. People my age or older will remember events like the one that I'm getting ready to share with you, to read to you, that he writes about. If you're too young to remember, you can still understand what's going on. And this is a great story about what it means for God to invite us to share a meal with Him. So, let this sink in this morning really deep. Like I said, you can close your eyes. You don't have to. Here's the story. Do you remember when they had old-fashioned church picnics? I do. As I recall, it was back in the olden days, as my kids would say, back before they had air conditioning. They said, we'll all meet at Sycamore Lodge in Shelby Park at 4.30 on Saturday. You bring your supper and we'll furnish the iced tea. But if you were like me, you came home at the last minute. And when you got ready to pack your picnic, all you could find in the refrigerator was one dried up piece of bologna and just enough mustard in the bottom of the jar that you got it all over your knuckles trying to get it. And just two slices of stale bread to go with it. So you made your bologna sandwich and wrapped it in an old brown bag and went to the picnic. When it came time to eat, you sat at the end of the table and spread out your sandwich. But the folks who sat next to you brought a feast. The lady was a good cook and she had worked hard all day to get ready for the picnic. And she had fried chicken. No, no, I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't even think of it. You murmured in embarrassment with one eye on the chicken. Oh, come on. There's plenty of chicken and plenty of pie and plenty of everything. And we just love bologna sandwiches. Let's just put it all together. And so you did. And there you sat, eating like a king, when you came like a beggar. One day, it dawned on me that God had been saying just that sort of thing to me. Why don't you take what you have and what you are, and I will take what I have and what I am, and we'll share it together. I began to see that when I put what I had and was and am and hope to be with what He is, I had stumbled upon the bargain of a lifetime. I get to thinking sometimes, thinking of me sharing with God, and when I think of how little I bring, and how much He brings and invites me to share, I know that I should be shouting to the housetop, I am and can be to a person, I will be to you. When I think about it like that, it really amuses me to see somebody 
running along through life, hanging onto their dumb bag with that stale bologna sandwich in it, saying, God's not going to get my sandwich. No siree, not this time. This is mine. Did you ever see anybody like that? So needy, just about half starved to death, yet hanging on for dear life. It's not that God needs your sandwich. The fact is, you need his chicken. Well, go ahead. Eat your bologna sandwich as long as you can. But when you can't stand its tastelessness or drabness any longer, when you get so tired of running your own life by yourself and doing it your way and figuring out all the answers with no one to help, when trying to accumulate, hold, grasp, and keep everything together in your own strength gets to be too big a load, when you real, begin to realize that by yourself you're never going to be able to fulfill your dreams, I hope you'll remember that it doesn't have to be that way. You have been invited to something better, you know. You've been invited to share in the very being of God. And the invitation is still open. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this wonderful story in your word. A meal that began 2,000 years ago that as believers we still get to participate in. And by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, you're a risen Savior. You're alive today and your Spirit is right here with us. And you share in this meal with us. And we thank you. We give you all the glory and you give us all your grace. What a wonderful trade that is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.